Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And it's time to head back into the hills of Tennessee for one of the most unique distillery experiences that I have ever had. How unique? Well, let's just say I had to meet the founder over at a local hardware store. We got some sandwiches there. Then we rode off to a spot in the road where I parked my car. And then he took me in a 4x4 over to the distillery because the road is a little rough. And so once we got there, we had our lunch We talked a lot about history and talked a lot about his family and how he does his distilling. And then we had some moonshine, some gin, a little sweet mash whiskey, and then made our way over to the house slash cabin where we had a chance to finally sit down and do the interview. So let me tell you which distillery this is. It is Gobbler Springs Distillery. And the owner and distiller is John Hatcher. And John is doing some really creative stuff out at this distillery that is out in the woods. And we got a chance to talk a little bit about not only his distilling processes, including one that he has named after the county that he's in, But we also got a chance to talk a lot about history. And so we're going to cover a lot of the history in the front end of this conversation. We'll talk about a pioneer whose name has been changed, and we have been actually saying it wrong all of these years. So we're going to cover that early on. There was also a famous road that connected New Orleans to Nashville that ran right by where this property is. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But I also want to talk about those special processes that John's using. And one of the benefits that he gets out of this process is really kind of conservation of his wood source, but also bringing more consistency to his whiskey. It's a fun conversation. So let's jump right in with John Hatcher of Gobbler Springs Distillery. Well, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, very fascinating tour that you gave me of the distillery. You called it the world's smallest distillery. I don't know if I would agree with that, but it is it is small and it is out in the country. And um, taking the road to get up here, you gave me a lift up the hill, which was which was nice because I've been to some, on some rough roads. But we actually had to cross a natural spring that was crossing the the road. So, and by the old terminology, that would be fording the creek. Fording the creek. Yes. So we forded the creek. We got here, and you gave me a chance to taste some of your moonshine and also your gin, which uh, you refer to, or I think I referred to as um, the gin for people who don't like gin. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it has its own um, character to it. It's really nice. And um, so one of the things that I didn't know about Gobbler Springs and about you and, and all of this by just taking an initial peek at the website is all the history that kind of surrounds your family and also, one of your products uses the date 1821, which is your moonshine, and the significance of that date. And so, it's an interesting thing that sometimes we learn bits of history we had no idea existed, or something that we've learned our whole life we find out is wrong. So, when I say Davy Crockett, what do you say? That's not how they say it here. <laughs> Dave, Davy Crockett came from the mind of Walt Disney. Okay. And um, the um, and I'm not a native uh, from here either. I'm from Kentucky originally. I've lived here 30 some years, almost 40 now. And um, one of the first things I learned that it's David Crockett Park. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no Davy Crockett at the Alamo. That was David Crockett. So uh, <laughs> Davy was just a friendly way to. F- Feed it to kids. It, it, it just fed it into the into the narrative. Nice. Yes. So uh, it's it's like uh, me saying Louisville, and you said, ah, oh, you you got that right. It's exactly. A, it's it, it's being in the know, but 
um, when I first saw David Crockett State Park, I had to go look it up because I thought, are they talking about Davy Crockett? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's so ingrained in my brain. As, as in everyone's. Yeah. It, it, it is. It yeah. Is. So how did you end up finding out about that? story well in when i moved here you know, i've always wanted to experience myself in the local history and i've uh, worked at a newspaper for a few years my background is a commercial photographer so uh, um and i've delved into the history and, and if you go to david crockett state park mm -hmm. you will actually learn you know where the grist mill was and the uh, the powder mill and the uh, and the distillery he had um, all three industries that actually washed away in the year 1821 mm -hmm. So we're coming upon, and actually it was in September, which will be uh, next month. Yeah. So it'll be the 200th anniversary of the uh, Shoal Creek flood, I guess, that took two or three industries out of Lawrence County, Tennessee. And, and my question is, did you did you watch the old Davy Crockett Oh, most movies? definitely. Okay. Was he distilling in any of those? No. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. That, that was... Uh, my brother, he grew up in that, that era, so he really loved Davy Crockett. Yeah. Uh, me, I was a little, uh, I came a little bit later, I was watching reruns. But it, it was funny, it, back in the day, I guess when there was uh, federal money and, and the parks were running a little bit, or state money for Tennessee, you could actually go and see the grist mill. They have a, a grist mill that actually would work and turn, and then they had a mini theater that would show Davy Crockett. The movie? The movies and things in the so show. They're, so they're basically <coughs> showing you a, a piece of uh, replicated history, but then giving you the wrong history. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, uh, and so, well, I don't know that the state park is is um, as concerned about Davy and David as the locals. Yeah. The ones actually from Lawrence County are the, are the interesting ones. Yeah. And he did a lot of things as he was... Uh, I think as he left Lawrence County, he wasn't well liked because he didn't like to pay his bills. I think, and he mm -hmm. left owing a little bit of money, which I guess you would if you'd been devastated with a flood and had no uh, nothing, nothing there. But I think um, he uh, introduced some of the first legislation and uh, and helped develop Lawrence County itself. Um, and I hope you get a chance to talk to the local historian because he can give you a lot of facts about David Crockett and and how uh, influential he was in the area uh, yeah. at the time. Fascinating because um, he's not somebody that we would initially think of as a distiller. Right. We we right. take these these heroes and we go, okay, well he's always out on the frontier somewhere Killing doing so. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Killed a bar when he was only three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. but that's not true either. <laughs> that, that was that was Davy, not David. That was Davy. Okay, that's the fictional character. So everybody needs to to make sure they get that right. So I learned a lot about this area. It just by reading some of the notes that that you sent to me that i wasn't really aware of and on the podcast we haven't really talked much about the war of 1812 and the the battle that happened at new orleans a couple of years or well 1815 when the whole thing was was over but i didn't realize that um you know the natchez trace has always been what i've known as the path to the south and that right through this area, they actually had a road called the Jackson oh, Road. Military Road. Military Road, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the idea of that was basically to get um, access between New Orleans and Nashville. Civilization in Nashville, yeah. Yeah, for military mm -hmm. purposes. It was a shortcut. It was actually a shorter distance, I think, to, uh, to the area than the Natchez Trace. Yeah. Makes you wonder how much of that area still could be mapped out. And, you can still and follow seen. the old trace. You can, can still you? follow the old military road. You can still follow yeah. pieces of that. Okay. Yeah. Kind of starts and stops. It does. It's a little bit uh, east of here. Um, the road that comes through here would be the. Uh, um, it was more important way to get to Shallow and the river. So if you got to this area, you're getting off of the Jackson. Um, road and headed more towards the river in shallow yeah in that area so what drew you to this area purely accident yeah uh it, well it, it, there's two things it, it, i guess the question would be in, in to this area in living here or starting a distillery in starting a distillery here yeah because you're originally from kentucky. kentucky exactly yeah yeah i grew up in a little uh i was born in glasgow which is uh 
around Bowling Green, mm-hmm. east of, of Bowling Green a little bit. I actually am from a little farming community called Smith's Grove. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a small town of 900 population, I guess, a very small town. But I, I moved to this area as a photographer. Uh, I shot school pictures, and the gentleman, um, uh, Henry Harris was his name, and he lived in Lawrenceburg. And my wife and I married my high school sweetheart, and we both uh, married, and she was midway through college and decided just to run off with me and live in Tennessee. So <laughs> uh, we've been here ever since. Nice. And um, But we, we found the area here, and it's a lot like home. You know, Middle Tennessee and Middle Kentucky are very similar in, in, in all mannerisms and ways, and the people were yeah. very well recepted here. Um, we've made great friends here and, and just become home. It's so out in the middle of nowhere, it feels like, because you're, well, to get here, I was very happy that it's a pretty modern highway coming out through, and then you get into, and you're going to have to say the name of the town where I met you. Well, most folks call it Henryville if you look at it at first uh, first uh, glance, but yeah. if you live here, it's called Henryville. Okay. you, you got to drop the Y, so, so yeah. if you're around here in Henryville. It's kind of kind of funny. Uh, one of the guys told me, he said, you can always tell the um, that we wanted to pick on the folks uh, in Summertown. There was always a rivalry. And he said, if you wanted to make fun of them, you, cut, you say... Uh, uh, Henryville, mm-hmm. and uh, if uh, but if you want them to fight, you call it Hooterville. <laughs> <laughs> nice. so, so it's uh, and I, I, I kind of look at Henryville. Um, if you look on our bottles and our distil- uh, the distilling practices, we have to actually label ourselves from Lawrenceburg because that's the closest. That's our post office address. Oh, okay. So um, Henryville is unincorporated. So yeah. we're actually in the community of Henryville. But we actually have to say that we're in, we're distilled and bottled in Lawrenceburg. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I feel that you know, most of the folks that come to Hennerville and you tell them that's where we are, uh, I've always kind of kidded to say that, well, when you get to Hennerville, you think you're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and most people think that. And I said, the people in Hennerville think our distillery is in the middle of nowhere. So, <laughs> so, so that kind of tells you as to how far we are away from Hennerville. We're another couple of miles north and very remote. Yeah. Well, we were talking about the... Um place that we met it's funny because we were texting back and forth and we're going to meet at clark's hardware and we were going to have lunch there and so i thought i picture a restaurant and so i texted you and said um look for the tall guy i'll be wearing a blue shirt you you were so polite not just to not send back a, a message going uh Sorry, but I'm not going to need to know what you look like because when I walked in, it is a hardware store, and um, at one of those one of those that I remember when I was growing up as a kid. It's one of those kind of places that you probably go to and you ask the proprietor for something you would never in a million years think you'd find at the hardware store, and they'll find it on a dusty shelf somewhere. Exactly in the back. what it is. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Wonderful people. It, it's a uh, you know, it's just rural America, and it's vanishing. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I loved to go the you know to the the stores like that and get a sandwich and you know wrapped up in a paper towel and off you go. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's uh, unfortunately it's all kind of disappearing. It's a great part of Americana that we're losing. Yeah. So when we're talking about your experience in the distilling industry and how you've gotten into all of this, um, it comes down to more your history. Exactly. your family history so um talk a little bit about what are your earliest recollections of hearing about the family being in moonshine because you're well, a f- fourth fourth generation right exactly yeah. so so my great grandfather um he immigrated from ireland in 1821 which you know coincidentally it comes back to the name that we gave to our moonshine mm-hmm. so not only is it kind of in honor of uh, david crockett but it's also uh, coincidentally the year my great grandfather immigrated here mm. so he, he immigrated here as a child that we can only assume that he was orphaned during the potato famine and he came to uh, Lexington Courthouse Virginia where he learned to uh, distill alcohol mm-hmm. and um, as a young man he migrated uh, to Kentucky and got some land and started his own distillery and uh, so that was you know growing up I heard from <clears throat> both sides of my family 
the Hatcher side of my family consumed it, and my mother's side of the family actually made it. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of where we get on that. So nice. But as a kid, you know, I heard my father talk about he would visit, you know, aunts and things, and, and he grew up in Kentucky and uh, around Smith's Grove. And every morning he'd look out and see this, the smoke of four or five stills running. <laughs> um, and then the largest still in the country was from his best friend across the, the neighboring farm. And he was later, when he was, uh, he actually lost his still and went to prison and was banned from Warren County, Kentucky, I reckon, for quite a while. Oh, but as a, as a young man, my father would go get my great-grandmother he would get her some moonshine every afternoon before she went to bed. So she had to have a cup of moonshine before oh, man. <laughs> before she went to bed every night. I guess that was her uh, her nightcap. And so he, um, but I remember as a as a child traveling to um, just various places. We we went to uh, I guess the most fascinating place I ever went to was a man named Jim Smith, mm-hmm. and he lived over in. Uh, on the Kentucky Tennessee line, and my father had heard about him when uh, he went to work for uh, Firestone Textiles, which he went to a public job uh, during the 70s after we got out of farming. And uh, this guy kept talking about this man that just uh, he lost his uh, wife and, and his um, and his kids in a in a tragic way, and he just ended up at this little cave. And it was just this little dugout cave and, and 20 miles in the middle. If you think this is remote, this was really remote. <laughs> and so my father was wanted to go see him. And so we ended up, and he was a squatter. And the timber company that owned the land could never cut the timber because as long as he was alive, he got to live. And he had, you could see, almost 10 or 15 miles across this beautiful valley. And he had become a hermit. And basically had a little moonshine still and had a little garden and had a, <laughs> and a, and an old mule and he'd ride to town occasionally about once a month. And, uh, and, and he apparently made some of the best moonshine there was because we'd spend a weekend and little, you know, one or two people would come traipsing down. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so that was always fascinating me as a kid. Fueled on, and, uh, on moonshine. Uh, yes. What was he eating? Tree bark and moonshine? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he had a very interesting, secluded life and uh, so you know it's just tales like that that always just fascinated me as a child and and all the neighbors at the uh, you know at the local body shop and the hangouts and things you could always go to the freezer and get a get a shot of moonshine mm-hmm. and, and so that was just something that was just part of the lore I guess as, as a child yeah and uh, of course I never got to partake in any of it but I always got to watch those that did mm-hmm. <laughs> so, how long did you watch them <laughs> so, you know, it was uh, you know I've always been fascinated in going to the distilleries and and uh, you know, chemistry has always been a passion of mine anyway, so so I enjoy the uh, the fermentation. My mother, um, she was never in the distilling industry, but I go back to my, um, my great-grandfather, and then my grandfather also worked in the distillery as a child. Mm-hmm. And during Prohibition, they had to shut the distillery down, and then afterwards they decided not to reapply for a license. Okay. Now, my mother knew <clears throat> a little bit about everything that was going on, but she uh, knew nothing of the distillery, but w- the family still made wine. And um, her brothers made wine. And so as a child, again, we would go visit them in Ohio. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, they lived in Dayton. And it was always fascinating to me to see the, the wine and, and doing that. So my mother taught me to make wine as a child. It wasn't very good wine, but we learned fermentation. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we made pickles and anything. So fermentation's always been a curiosity to me as well. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, you know, with Prohibition and the rest, and we were talking about um, your mother's side of the family is the Toomey side. Exactly, yes. And so the first thing that I do in my research brain says is go find Toomeys in the distilling yeah. industry and see if I can find them. But you, you actually have tried to hunt down... The old steel numbers, the old, yeah, and, yeah, and, and see if you can buy it. Yeah, apparently all the records in Frankfurt, uh, there was a f- terrible fire. Or, I don't guess there's any such thing as a good fire, but a fire burned all the records, so there are no records. Mm. Um, the best that we could tell that it may have been. So this, we've looked through all the records, and then I've, it kind of dawned on me that he was the only Toomey male, and there was a couple of sisters named Shirley. 
mm-hmm. so that it's entirely possible if you start asking folks about the Shirley still but now we're looking at folks that are anybody that would know anything are long gone yeah that's so unfortunately there's just no way to you know I've visited summer shade I've tried to talk to the old ancestors and there's just no no tales there it's something's going to be hidden in a wall <clears throat> or an attic somewhere and, and probably not even that you know, <laughs> I, would say, I would almost venture to say that it's all gone yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing out here at Gobbler Springs. For me, it was, I actually first saw the distillery name pop up probably about a year and a half ago on Google Maps. I was trying to find every distillery in Tennessee and map out what my journey was going to be. And there wasn't much information about it. And then here, as I'm now rounding up and hitting the very last distillery that I know of in Tennessee, I go, oh, Gobbler Springs. There is a website there. And uh, so talk about your uh, getting the distillery started and um, and kind of your your path to where you're at right now. Sure. We uh are. Uh, we first started making whiskey or had a, a, our license in 2017. And um, from there, we weren't really interested in, in attracting any visitors. We, we were just wanting to be low-key. Mm-hmm. And this was originally set up as a test distillery. Mm. We wanted to make sure that our recipes were solid, that our labels were solid, that, that everything as far as uh, TTB was, uh, you know, Everything was up and in, in line before we made a huge um, exorbitant investment in equipment and technology and so forth. So, and we really didn't aim to, aim to stay here. You mm-hmm. know, this was originally in two, 2017. We actually had looked at three other places to put the distillery. And for various reasons, um, it ends up that I guess we needed to be here. And, mm-hmm. and I guess in the long run, I'm, I'm glad. Um, we had looked at being in possibly downtown Florence. And downtown Columbia, Tennessee, um, and I look at the hustle and bustle and traffic and all that every day. And uh, um, you know, if you get back to Hinterval, a, a traffic jam in Hinterval is when two Amish buggies meet. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, <clears throat> the peace and quiet out here has been a you know a very good thing. We're in the center of 400 acres. Yeah. Um, you know, even our our closest neighbors are a mile away, and, and uh, so and then we're on the backside. We've got a mile Buffalo River. Uh, water frontage so once you get here you can't go any farther so, unless you want to <laughs> swim <laughs> yeah and uh so um and then we still don't know what's going to transform here uh we we've talked about a, a barbecue cooking school we've talked about um you know possibly putting music on the river and, and having a venue there but it, as you notice coming in you know our road's a difficult challenge uh, mm. it, it takes an suv or a truck to get here and we'll overcome that. We may put a bridge in at some point. There's a lot of people that really say, no, don't do that. You know, we enjoy coming <laughs> back. And, you know, it's it's a, it's an adventure just getting here. Yeah. Um, it's, know, we, it's, it's a distillery for people who own 4 by 4s Exactly. So, so, uh, <laughs> but we are accommodating. We will go pick you up yeah. at the road if we have to. So anything we can do. And I say we very lightly because it's me right now. Yeah. <laughs> this is truly, if you're going to say the smallest distillery in the world, well, you can't get much smaller than one person. Exactly. Now we are the largest distillery in the, in, in Lawrence County. Okay. All that. right. Well, <laughs> largest legal distillery yeah. in Lawrence County. <laughs> they say they, that. Yes. Yeah. They, they joke at the store that the bootlegger down the road has a bigger still than I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but ours is the the largest legal still in Lawrence County. So, yeah. So that's a good thing. So, um, how did you start out in creating a whiskey? Well, it, it, it started out as, a, as just, a, um, just as a hobby, just wanted to kind of figure out if I could do it. it you know, it's one thing that uh, uh, my brother, you know, had played around and, and, and I just kind of looked and watched and, and it's on TV and everybody talks about it. And I said, you know what, I believe I could do this. Mm-hmm. It's not rocket science. And I've drank so much bad whiskey. And, <laughs> gosh, it, it was, uh, and, and I started out just, just wondering if I could do it or not. Yeah, and um, it was, um, and I've made some mistakes. I, I've, I've, uh, but in the years, I guess I've been playing around now for probably ten years, twelve years, and um, 
I've, I've made all the common mistakes, and, 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 and I'm sure I still will continue to make mistakes. But I feel in, it, there was a point that, it, that the uh, stars aligned and, and everything came together for the business opportunity and the partnership, and I've got great partners. And that's when things materialized that uh, said, you know what, we can make a, a good product. Yeah. And unlike most distilleries, we're out to make a brand, not just a, you know, uh, uh, we'd rather this be a destination at some point and actually truly build a brand. And mm. we're building it around people. Um, we love the people who visit us. The, most of them are returning visitors. Uh, they bring somebody with them each time. And, and that's the, you know, the way I look at success is the um, is the repeat customers you know if they were just uh, you know buying a bottle taking a drink and leaving and never see them again that'd be yeah. one thing but when they come back and bring others I, I think that's just a, a good um, good benchmark that we can build on yeah well it's this is the first tour where I've had somebody come pick me up so that, we, that, we, we want to be hospitable if nothing else <laughs> well you you've definitely achieved that <clears throat> so yeah. So your uh, bottle of whiskey says sweet mash. So um, in in learning and trying to devise your own whiskey, um, what were the things that you thought were important to do in your own whiskey? If you're going to put sweet mash on the, on the bottle, my assumption is is that you feel that that was that was pretty important to the way that you make your whiskey. Well, it it, it actually. You know, being a novice and, and walking into something with, uh, you know, being naive and young and, and innocent into the industry is, is probably a good thing. In, in the long run, um, you have no preconceived ideas. Um, and I've always been one to, uh, I love history, I love the facts, I love the, uh, um, the whole, everything about it is being genuine, but I'm also willing to jump outside the box. Any, anybody that knows me knows that Anything I I look at or anything I do, I want to know the rules. I want to know what's going on, but I get right to the edge. I, I want to I want to see how far I can explore outside the box. Yeah, and and I think um, with that, I think by some of the equipment that I've built, some of the things that I've that, that you'll see are very unique in in the fact that. Um, you know, being poor helps out a lot too. It, 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 it's uh, the <laughs> mother of invention. Yes, yes. It's, uh, yes. Um, so we didn't have engineers. We didn't have all that to, to start with. So it starts out with, uh, you know, I've got some very good welder friends. I've got uh, you know some good good people that you know say, well, here's what we needed to do. How are we going to do this? And how are we going to do that? So, yeah. so that's kind of the way I and I've researched a lot of places and I've looked at different distilleries. And I tried to find the good and the bad in all of them. And I tried to look at what can I do that's different. Um, everybody can follow, but it's hard to go out and blaze a new trail. Yeah. And I look at that. I think that if you taste our whiskey, it's a little. Um, all of our products are unique. That they're not just like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And I think they're palatable. And I wanted to make something that I would drink myself. Yeah. If I'm not going to drink it, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that sometimes when you get new distillers and you taste their spirits, and one of the hardest things, I think, for me, is going and sitting in front of a new distiller and they give something me, for me to taste and then they say, give me your opinion, and then I taste it and it's like all ethanol. It's just, it, it, it feels like it needs some time and I was very happy with the fact that yours did not have that. Um, it, it, it was, um, I try to avoid using the word smooth because it's not overly descriptive beyond just an experience of drinking. Um, but it, it's a very pleasant and easy to drink whiskey. And for something that you say, this was probably aged three years, yeah. Um, that the rough edges are off of it so that's that's already a credit to to what you're doing yeah. Yeah. um so and i think that is the hardest thing at this point when people are trying to make money off of their whiskey to survive is that they sort of feel this pressure to go out and sell it immediately or go to the gins and, and vodkas to survive what was your what was your thought when you first started out did you feel like you needed to go the the gin and vodka route to no, no actually gin and vodka was actually a, a second thought 
mm-hmm. uh, we actually intend and, and fully intend to still um, stay with whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, we understand that to be our future. And then I guess I've learned one thing through the years, and it's one of the old adages a lot of people say, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. That's true. And, and so uh, I've heard of so many distilleries that come out, and, and they have to be so eager to get a product out that they do so. And then, you know, if you ever taste a bad product, you're not going to come back. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that the first product that we, you know, we started in 2017. And um, so... You know, it's one of those things that that we wanted to make sure that that we had a palatable whiskey coming out, and I fully expect our whiskeys in the next two or three years to be even better, in, in the ways that I have changed in refining the still, in the way the distillation process is, process is, and the way the the columns run, and and uh, so I think things will keep on improving. Yeah, and. Um, so it's um, now. I will say we stumbled across a gin that I think will probably become one of our best sellers, mm. and we're um, you know whiskey is made with with time. You can't be in a hurry with that. <laughs> and I will say gin was something I didn't expect to make. The yeah. the pandemic kind of caused me to make gin, and uh, you know everybody makes a vodka, so there's nothing special about that. And it's a. Uh, um, and I hate I hate you. You know, yeah, yeah. I had a bad experience with it when I was in my twenties, and I kept on telling myself, I said, "Well, I've got vodka, so I don't want to make gin. I don't like gin." <laughs> and so I would get with with folks, and I had twenty tasters at once. I guess you know the people that were gin aficionados, and so I made my gins, and uh, um, and so the group would tell me, "Well, that's half of them would say, well, that's too much juniper." And at the same time, the other half was saying, well, it's not enough juniper. <laughs> and, uh, and so finally, after about, um, I guess it was about 10 different variations of gin I made, and I finally said, you know what, I'm through with you. I'm yeah. going to make one that I can drink. And so I started tasting uh, different botanicals, and uh, I had about 19 to 20 um, botanicals to start with. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to start back to square one. And so I would taste each botanical, and I would I would kind of weigh them out as to what I liked and what I didn't like, and um, and ended up with a uh, and it, I probably should call it recipe number fourteen. It, it should be named fourteen gin. That was my fourteenth recipe that we actually hit mm-hmm. on what we thought was a a good flavorful gin that I could actually that I enjoy. Yeah. And it's actually become my favorite drink now. And I, I would <laughs> never say that thirty years ago. It, and it has it has that juniper in it, but it's not overpowering. overpowering. It, right. it doesn't steal. It did not remind me of pine sol, which right. is what exactly. it was always the thing I couldn't yes. deal with yes. with yes. with gin. And we've created a new drink, and we haven't named it yet. Uh, it's uh, right now. It's probably um, going to be called a blackberry slammer. Uh, and and. Uh, I was just thinking today we may call it giggle juice. I, I was thinking that other. I, I don't know what the name is going to be, but yeah. it's. Uh, and my wife came across it, and it's um, um, Ocean Spray makes a cran blackberry juice, mm-hmm. and we started with that. But then we can't get that. I guess during the pandemic. So now we've just sourced our own materials, and we're going to create our own beverage nice. now. Nice. But I never would have thought the. I'm not. I'm not a fan of tonic water. I don't like the quinine. Yeah. And so I've never been a you know gin martini kind of a gin and tonic kind of guy. I've never done that. Yeah. And so, but this is a really pleasant drink, and and most gin drinkers have they like it, and and they say it's different uh, that it's not as you know way out there that they normally expect. And then you've got other people that say, well, I don't like gin. But when they taste this, they'll say, "Wow, that's great! I like mm. that." So, yeah. And I think I've accomplished another um, goal with our spirit in making something that number one, I'm not going to make something that I don't like to drink. So, and then the other good thing about it is others find it pleasing as well. Yeah. So you coined another name, which is the Lawrence County process. So. Describe to me what the Lawrence County process is. Well, again, not one to follow everyone else. The way Tennessee has the Lincoln County process, and we don't make a sour mash whiskey, mm-hmm. and we don't use um, the same type of um, process from start to finish that any of the other distilleries do in, in, in making a sour mash whiskey. So we figured we needed a new new name and a new uh, technology, and um and so we coined the word uh the phrase lawrence county process because it's similar to the lincoln county process we follow most of the same um, ideas of that principle we just don't use the same things Mm -hmm. Um, our charcoal and filtering is a little different 
uh, we do we charcoal uh, filter twice we do before we put it uh, into uh, our barrels and then we also filter it as it comes out okay you also have a different way of aging we do we call it a inside out aging and um, it's as we look to the future and look to you know what all we hear about you know whether you believe in climate change whether you uh, look at how we need to be uh, conservation minded however you feel about that i think that we need to leave um, uh, the planet better than we found it um, I, I don't see how anybody could disagree with that right. uh, we source our own um, white oak from the farm uh, i'm still working off the first tree we cut up and um, so we actually char the wood and actually what barrel makers would typically throw away is what i love mm. you know i love the uh i love the cracks i love the knots i love all that i hand char every stick that that goes into our barrels and um and it's done with care you know i, I put an alligator char on, on probably two-thirds of them i, I kind of get my own kind of feeling of what the char should look like and um you know, we feel that what we're doing is is by harvesting that one tree, I put 50 out in its place. So I think that um, there's an expected shortage of white oak in the next 20 years. Uh, I don't want that to happen here. You know, we want to put back what yeah. what we're uh, taking away. So I think we're achieving that process. And, and I really don't see that it's the barrel itself that makes the whiskey. It's the charred white oak. Mm. And, and I think more people are going to start looking at, at other alternative ways to, um, um, you know, I still use new charred white oak. Yeah. It's you're just, just not, you're, you're just putting it into the liquid rather than surrounding the liquid exactly. with it. The same circumference is there. Well, and when you first mentioned this to me, um, it was after I had made the comment about how barrels can have 44 staves around them and you can have two barrels side by side and put the same whiskey into both of them age them the same amount of time and they're going to taste different the whole issue with buying a single barrel whiskey and expecting it to be the same as another is very tough because every single piece of wood surrounding that whiskey has been through a different it may come from a different tree may have gone through a different aging process may come from a different section of the tree um there there's so many different elements just in those staves alone that can create a different flavor profile between the two barrels and so you're actually kind of solving that issue by having one piece of wood that you're putting down into a barrel uh, that is not made of wood so that it's not getting any of the interaction with the vessel it's in just that piece of wood well, you, you, may, you may have noticed there's more than one piece of wood in that barrel oh is there okay yeah there's enough to make the circumference oh, of that barrel okay yeah so okay. it's the so same amount of area yeah that but all from the, the same all from the same tree in fact not only that one barrel but every barrel of whiskey i have made so far is yeah. sourced from the same tree okay <laughs> so let me ask and you and the next two or three hundred barrels will be too you can <laughs> quite a few barrels out of a tree if you do the it, it, it's what i'm doing yeah so let me ask you the question then that you probably get asked a lot on your tours and that i hear at other tours a lot what do you do with the wood after you've uh, finished using it the one time? You know, uh, that's going to be the next. Um, right now, we're just at the point of that's not a question. That that's um, I've actually given the first um, the first two or three barrels that that made our first whiskey. Uh, we gave it to a local winery, mm -hmm. and they're experimenting with with their wine with it. Okay. Um, yeah. The next step is. Uh, Probably what I'm going to do with the next barrel, which will come off in about three months, and, and that's the worst thing that we are now, that since we are young, is there's a very limited supply of our whiskey. Um, I'll probably be taking a barrel off maybe once every three months for the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. and, and next year we'll kind of probably go into a little bit higher production. Um, but I'm really thinking about aging the gin. You know, ah, I'm, I'm okay. thinking about taking the uh, once that barrel's empty. I'm thinking about putting some gin in there and see what it does. Okay. Yeah. I've um, you know heard a little bit about um, aged gin, so hey, why not? I hate to throw it away. Yeah. Um, 
I hate to. What what could be done? Let's just say that, um, God forbid, there were no more white oak. I could actually drive it uh, or dry it out, run it through a planer, and reuse it. Mm. So it could be because when you char that oak, it's only going down maybe a, an eighth of an inch. Well, yeah, and those. I mean, I saw what these things look like, and they look like you know, post. They're two by two. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So I mean, they are they are significant. So yeah, I could see. So they're not staves as much as because what I you know I started to say well sh- should I do it thinner? Um, then I ran into the charring aspect of it. So so when I'm charring it, it's easier to do as long as every side is the same dimension. Then I'm getting I can do the same char all the way around. Yeah. And then the butt ends are really where I, I, I spend more time. Uh, that's where you can really get into the charring because usually they're split. And, and you can see some crevices, and, and so, you know, I really feel that uh, as the whiskey gets on up, you know, I, I may not live to see it, but I can't, you know, everybody's drinking it before it can get to be eight or ten <laughs> years old, but if I can ever get any to eight and ten years old, um, and I just go by what people say early on, um, a very in- influential uh, whiskey connoisseur i guess when he first tasted what we were doing um his first reaction was this will one day be a world-class whiskey Mm. well you can't ask for more than that so we were talking about the mash bill which is 80 percent corn 20 percent wheat wheat. exactly and we got into the discussion about weeded whiskeys and how they tend to be able to do a little better with age and so but you have actually put your whiskey in with some other whiskeys in, in a tasting uh, and you had some Pappy Van Winkle in there as well which everybody seems to feel is the, the gold standard for whiskey or is worth paying um, it used to be $800 now it's you know who knows um, but I, I was really interested in, in your uh, uh, opinion and the results of that because uh, first thing was what your feeling was about Pappy. Now, what year was it? Was it 23 or was it 15 or? You know, I don't know. It's probably, it, it was an older one. So yeah. whatever th- this was, um, it, it was probably, it was probably the 23. Okay. Uh, it, it was an older, it was one of the rare bottles. Yeah. So I guess that would be a 23. Yeah. And so your opinion of that was? You know, I thought it was a little witty. Yeah. Um, and, and we all, and I say in that group, uh, I was invited to a uh, whiskey tasting in, um, because they had heard of my whiskey. And, and it, ironically enough, it was the night they were, um, and it's actually a class on um, um teaching people how to taste whiskey and and so it was a it was an educational class mm-hmm. and it was actually uh, kentucky we did whiskeys that night okay and and out of that there was um i think about 28 whiskeys that were tasted which uh, I, when i first went in i'd never been to anything you know tasting that many whiskeys yeah, but yeah. i thought my god how am i gonna get on <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, i did realize that that you had a very small sampling and then there were whiskeys you didn't have to taste yeah so so um through the night, it, it was very interesting, and, and I will say, it, it, it goes back to uh, um, what my wife and I we went out to dinner a few weeks ago, and and we went to a nice steakhouse, and then there's a regular place we go that that uh, that is a lot more reasonable. They have a Saturday night ribeye special for fourteen dollars, and then uh, she was taking me out to dinner this this particular night, and, and our bill was eighty some dollars, I think, and it was a great steak, and and, and we were talking about it. I said, let me ask you something. Would you rather go to, to you know, the steakhouse we normally go to four times, or would you rather go to this one once? And, you know, she kind of, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it kind of goes back to that same thing. Would you rather buy, you know, one bottle for eight hundred dollars, or would you rather buy? Would you rather drink mine for, for, for thirty bucks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so, that same so, price. Yeah. So you know, and I understand there's there's all over the board, uh, but it comes down to. Um, you know what you like, yeah. and 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 I will say during that night of tasting, mine wasn't the best whiskey, nor did I even expect it to be, and it was just this is you know just a blind crowd that that they had no expectations, they were just grading the whiskeys, mm-hmm. and they graded them on on certain scales, and mine came up and it was graded just like you know the Pappy was and the other things that we tested the Weller and 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 uh, the different ones, 
And, you know, at the end of the night when all the scores were read out, I was in the middle. I mean, and I said, yeah. well, it's pretty good. Yeah. You know? Three-year whiskey up against a 23-year-old yeah. yeah. whiskey I, that goes I, for $800 I, I, a bottle. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I wasn't the best, but I wasn't the worst. Yeah. And, you know, if I'd have been the worst, you know, I might have had, you know, my feelings hurt a little bit. But yeah. uh, my whiskey's never been into a judging yet. Uh, my moonshine and my gin were both uh, entered into a competition year before last. Mm -hmm. I chose not to enter last year. I kind of thought last year would be a jaded. Um, I, I just feel like the year uh, 2020 won't exist in the record books. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I'd hate has to say. It has a bad name already. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd say, you know, if. Uh, if I got a gold medal in, in 2020, they go, yeah, that's a pandemic nobody entered. Yeah, yeah, so so I, yeah. I chose not to enter last year. Uh, but the, the first year that we did enter, and, and we were with all the big the big name brands, and we ended up with silver medals with the Moonshine and the Gin. Nice. So for our first, uh, you know, we were looking for an unbiased opinion, and we wanted to get some uh, just some good positive feedback that we, you know, your friends are going to tell you it's good no matter what. Yeah. But these are from the professionals, and, and they, um, hey, the silver star, I'm silver medal, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> well, and especially since you are really, you know, tw 2017 mm -hmm. is your start. Yeah. yeah. So you're learning. Yeah, exactly. And you're, and you're growing. So, um, so where do you go from here? What's your next, uh, next hurdle, do you think? Well, it, it's hard to... Um, yeah, what's the old uh, adage that uh, um, if you can't take uh, the mountain to Muhammad, you got to take Muhammad to the mountain? <laughs> well, we can't really do that here. We can't really get people here. So, so that's the. Uh, um, I, I guess the next thing we've got to do, and I, I, it's one of those things I didn't realize, and it's being naive, is hey, I thought if you made whiskey, everybody'd buy it. You know, yeah. and uh, it, it's a struggle. It's a lot of competition. You're you're full, you're dealing with multi-million dollar corporations, and and this isn't the first time I've had that challenge. Um, my wife and I, uh, we go back to we're probably some of the first uh, people to ever use Macintosh computers. <laughs> uh, we we competed with uh, multi-million dollar newspaper corp, uh, corporations with uh, about ten thousand dollars worth of the first Macintoshes came out and published their own newspaper, and and we were. Um, Again, we were 24 years old and didn't know any better. Mm. And we competed with the uh, multi-million dollar presses. And, and uh, you know, I feel like here I am doing it again. So it's guerrilla warf warfare. And, and like any business, you just have to go out and beat the bushes. And you have to let people. Uh, the, the main thing is, and what I've noticed is, once people taste my product, they're happy with it. Yeah. And and um, most people come back. And that's what I've, I've said from the very beginning. And I've been to so many distilleries and, and tasting, and nothing against all of them. And everybody thinks they've got the best product, or they wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. But you know, some of them I just go yuck. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, I don't have that experience here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and sometimes the the uh, and, and I've noticed people that say they're whiskey drinkers, or or you know, I just kind of watch and learn, and and I can tell. You know, some of the expressions are like, oh, didn't expect that, but yeah. they would have done that on anything. Yeah, 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 it's just they're not expecting a, you know, a, an eighty or ninety proof alcohol, and it being a hundred degrees outside, and it's gonna it's gonna get you unless you're expecting it. Yeah, so, yeah. So I've tried to get people to at least um, be prepared and, and give them an experience, and, and hopefully they leave with a happy experience of, uh, you know, I, I want people to know as we grow that that we're always going to be a you know a family business. We're always going to be welcoming, and and we want people to leave with a good experience. So besides Henderville, where else can people go to get your We whiskey? are now in uh, Tennessee. Uh, we are probably in about 10 or 12 liquor stores. Um, in Lawrence County, we're in um, almost to the Alabama line, which is in the community of um, Loretta. Mm -hmm. Very nice liquor store. It's called the Hond House. Which is German, I think, for a doghouse. I think. Oh, okay. It's called the, the Hond House. Yeah. And I think that's the right name. A great, one of the nicest liquor stores you'll ever go in. And and, and then uh, in Lawrenceburg, we're in A to Z, and then on the north end of the state, we're in Portland in a small uh, liquor store there, and then we'll soon to be uh, we're in in Nashville as far east as Cookville, and as far west as Fort Campbell. And, okay. and so that's the nucleus. Um, Years ago, I, I heard a story about this man that, that uh, he uh, mined for diamonds. 
and, uh, and I hate to tell you these old stories, but they have a lot to do with, with how I look at life, I guess. He was, a, he was a diamond miner, and he traveled all over the world. He had this little plot of land um, that he'd always come back to, and he never was successful. He, um, he, he would go to the far reaches of Africa. He would go all these places and spend all this time and money looking for diamonds. And then uh, after he died, um, they um, leveled his house and was digging and found the world's largest diamond. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, then the moral of that story is uh, always mine for diamonds in your own backyard first. Nice. So, so I feel it's important that we have the support of Lawrence County first, and, uh, and then they've been very supportive, and the state of Tennessee, you know, secondly. And, um, you know, if we don't mine for our diamonds in Tennessee, there's no reason to go elsewhere. <laughs> so so our, next, uh, our next move will be um, Alabama, and then we'll probably go farther um, – East and West. I see no reason to go to Kentucky yet. That's where my ancestors or you know, where my friends and family from years are years ago and I could sell a lot there, but I just don't see the the need to, to push into that. I think South is the best way we can go to Alabama next. Well, in Kentucky you can just take a nice drive down into Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that's why we are in Portland and yeah. and, uh, and soon to be Gallatin. And uh, so in our next um Ventures. We're going to try to look at, and and this week I'll, I'm going to explore uh, the liquor laws in Tennessee, and, and they're different from state to state. And, and I wish the federal government would, you know, allow shipping uh, of of um, high proof alcohol. Uh, they do wine. It's just one of those things that it needs to be done in, in alcohol. And uh, and even from state to state, the laws are different. But now we're going to explore uh, with our new drink that we're really excited about, the gin and the cranberry and the blackberry juice we're going to try to go to different festivals and fairs and and, and sell that nice and then bottle that eventually and sell it as a as eventually as a mixed drink very good mm-hmm. well thank you very much for a great day this has been fun um i know Probably you're outside like, the scope of your average day you're <laughs> like yeah, yeah these are kind of humble surroundings and i hope you enjoy it here i'm like yeah i mean i feel like i get to sit out on the porch and sip on some whiskey and really get comfortable here <laughs> which you're more than welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately i have to get back to nashville for more uh, other stuff Good. well it's kind of funny that that is we um we've kind of talked about tours and and that's the um uh, the problem that we have when we do tours that you know typically you want to bring folks in and, and show them the area and, and run a circle and they leave and what we found is no matter what we do people want to stay <laughs> 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 which is fine yeah but it doesn't help you know when you've got you just pile up and pile up and that's what we envision yeah. is so that that's our goal next is uh, and again you know if you go to the trouble to come here to visit us we want to take the time to make sure you have a good time yeah but we also want to respect that you need some time to distill. <laughs> I understand. It, it's uh, no worries. In this time of year, I, I'm willing to take a break because it's it's hot and it's yeah. Day. Oh yeah, it was a little warm today. These 90s, I'm not a big fan of. Hey, I, I, I am really just humbled by the fact that you even wanted to come see us and appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Well, this is great. It's a treat, and I think the thing about doing distillery tours for me is uh, everyone I go to. Uh, I find something else very interesting about it that makes me glad that I went. And this is I, the more unique, the better. And this is definitely a very unique experience. So, well, let me ask you a question. What What did you find unique, and in, in, in what What did you think the highlight of your day was? Well, you talk about you talk about the hospitality, and and that's a big piece of it. And being able to uh, come out. It's the first time I've been picked up. Other than if I'm over at Bullet uh, doing a tour and they're driving me over from the visitor center to the uh, distillery itself, just because it's too far to hoof it. Um, but also just a, a chance to, well, we had lunch and got to enjoy chatting a bit before. That's why I, during this entire interview, I've been saying, we talked about, we talked about, because we probably spent a good two hours, I would say, just yeah. just chatting and, and having an enjoyable time doing that. So, um, yeah, it's very comfortable, and uh, Great. It, it, it does make you um, feel like it was worth the drive out here. Good. So, yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, and, and again, any you know, feedback we can get, we appreciate. Anything, yeah. Any ideas, we're always open. So, uh, um, you know, please feel free at any time. If you get a thought, let me know. Yeah. Whatever, whatever I can do to improve things, I'm more than willing to do it. Very nice. Well, I appreciate you, John. I, thank you for uh, 
it's been such a great day with me and uh, and for Thank sharing you. some with my audience. Great. Take care. And find out more about Gobbler Springs by heading to gobblerspringsdistillery.com. And if you enjoyed this interview, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. And find show notes, transcripts, social media links, books, and swag at whiskey-lore.com. Or support this independent podcast by joining the Whiskey Lore Society at patreon.com slash whiskey lore. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and until next time, cheers! And Slanjava. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC.